thank you so much, Teddy, for taking the time to meet with me today. Be uh, to get started, please tell us your full name and a little bit about your family of origin, where you're from. My name is Dr. Teddy Brody Osantowski, and my home is Chicago. My husband and I relocated to the Las Vegas area 12 years ago, and I've been married 38 years, and we have two children. Tell us about your parents' family, and do you have siblings, or? I'm an only child. Um, my grandfather was always a, a businessman, even though he was a farmer, he ran his farm as a business. Uh, his cash crop was tobacco. I wrote a, sort of a uh, uh, historical, half historical book about his life on the farm. And uh, that's in my book, which is called The Black Landed Gentry of Montgomery County. So both my parents were entrepreneurs. Uh, both my sons are entrepreneurs. My husband's an entrepreneur. I'm the only one who has uh, worked for someone else. And presently, I'm adjunct faculty at uh, UNLV, University of Nevada at Las Vegas. Also, uh, I'm chairperson of the um, National Coalition of 100 uh, Black Women. I'm the education chair. And we are having, on November 5th, a uh, workshop on the rights of, of of students in special education. The 100 Black Women has three main areas of community service. Health, education, and political. And my segment, as I said before, is, um, is education. One thing that we did that we're also very proud of, there's a school in West Las Vegas that was on the watch list, had been on the watch list for two years two or three years. The federal one. Of the, the watch list here through Clark County School District. Okay. So I decided that I would use my phonics program to teach the teachers at that school so that they could use phonics in teaching reading. And that's what we did. And the scores went up and now that school is no longer on the watch list. They have made Safe Harbor. And that was through the 100 Black Women promoting uh, the program with uh, a little bit of money. They purchased uh, breakfast and lunches for the students. And anytime I needed materials to use with the teachers, they were able to, uh, for, to refund me for any amount that I had spent. So, and we were all pretty proud of that because it's not every day that you can turn a school around. Tell us what the other two, a little bit about the other two areas of 100 Black Women, please. Well, our main focus health-wise is AIDS. And there's a rampant uh, epidemic of older African-American women uh, contacting the HIV virus. So we work, what I say we... Many of them are contacting it in relationships that they thought were monogamous. Yeah. Yes. And we... Our, our job is to make sure that they have the information that they need so that they can make a choice as to whether they want to do this or not. So many of the women are not aware that they are, are uh, subjected to That they're AIDS. at risk. Yes, that they're at risk, that they're subjected to AIDS or the HIV virus when they have these relationships. But we feel that with the information that we give out, and we have workshops for that, and uh, printed materials. And we go to different uh, conferences and have a table and we share all of this information with the attendees at the conferences. And the political action arm? We uh, are trying to have our members become interested in politics and become actual politicians. And they in turn- You mean they, run for elective office? Yes. And when they are aware of opportunities to learn, and, and we also make sure that they know where to go to learn, then we know that then they can help others. So it's a kind of a trickle-down uh, effect that we're doing. We start with our own members in the group, and they go and they disseminate the information to others. Why should a Caucasian 
care about the success of this organization? I believe, and it's just my personal belief, that if we could turn one school around, why then can't they have those same practices done at other schools and turn those schools around? If you're a taxpayer as I am, you want everybody to be independent to the point where you don't have to subsidize them. So I think if we can get more of the African American people into any kind of successful position, be it health, education, political, we are uplifting our people. When I say our people, I mean African American people, which indeed should keep a lot of them out of, what shall we say, some negative positions which might impact on our taxes being increased. Why do you care what happens to somebody else's kid? Well, as I said before, the reason I care about other people's kids, I look at my own sons. They are so successful, and I'm so proud of them. And I say, if my sons have that opportunity to do what they're doing, why can't other African-American people especially? I'm very, I'm doing the civil rights uh, years, I was very active. I've always been active in doing what is right and getting others to see that they should do what's right. So if my kids, my personal kids are successful, I want everybody's kids to be successful. I don't care who they are. I just want success. I want to see these young men and I'm just so proud of them when they are able to accomplish, be they mine or someone else's. So it's not only about me, it's about my people. So you feel connected to other people of African ancestry. Yes. That's why you, you feel connected in, as though I they're am, family. I am connected to them because we have so many traits uh, that are alike. And these are my people. I would never, ever disclaim them. And like I said, by that same token, I want to boost their accomplishments. And if I can do it, I'm going to do it, no matter what area it is. But by that same token, I'm on the Achievement Academy, and I'm the only African-American person there. But again, I have worked with special kids most of my teaching years, and I see the need there, too. And so if I can give them my ideas and my Who are your heroes? I can't pinpoint any one person who is my hero. You can name as many as you wish. But I can say that anyone who is working on making a change in the world in which we live is a hero to me. I don't care what they do as long as they're working to make a change. Is there anything I've neglected to ask you that you think needs to be said now? I believe in understanding, people understanding each other. I would like to see different minority groups with majority groups having exchange of ideas. Uh, and I think a lot of the misconceptions could be cleared up. For instance, I had, when I moved to this all white suburb, I had a neighbor who really was dis, uh, upset by me moving in and she didn't talk to me for about a year. And then after a year, she and I became very good friends. And I asked her why she was trying to treat me in the manner in which she was treating me. And she said, well, I always thought when black people moved in, they brought their mothers, their fathers, their aunts and uncle, and they filled up the house with relatives and that would make my property value go down. And that was something that could was easily cleared up just by me existing in that neighborhood with my husband and my two kids. So uh, if I could just get all these people together, sit down and talk through what you're afraid of or what you think about some negative thing that you think about someone else, and just come together, put, put your minds together, because uh, we've all got to live in this world, and I would hope that we can all live together in a peaceful way. Thank you very much for taking your precious time to meet with me and sharing your ideas with us. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful to you, Thank and you. I hope I added some value to you as well. Thank you.
Hi, thank you so much, Teddy, for taking the time to meet with me today. Be uh, to get started, please tell us your full name and a little bit about your family of origin, where you're from. My name is Dr. Teddy Brody Osantowski, and my home is Chicago. My husband and I relocated to the Las Vegas area 12 years ago, and I've been married 38 years, and we have two children. Tell us about your parents' family, and do you have siblings, or? I'm an only child. Um, my grandfather was always a, a businessman, even though he was a farmer, he ran his farm as a business. Uh, his cash crop was tobacco. I wrote a, sort of an, a, a historical, half historical book about his life on the farm, and uh, that's in my book, which is called The Black Landed Gentry of Montgomery County. So both my parents were entrepreneurs. Uh, both my sons are entrepreneurs. My husband's an entrepreneur. I'm the only one who has uh, worked for someone else. And presently, I'm adjunct faculty at uh, UNLV, University of Nevada at Las Vegas. I noticed that you're very focused on substance and child abuse. Yes. What, first of all, how are those two connected? And why is that important to you? Well, first let me say that uh, I'm an, I was an abused child from ages five on. Um, it was very important for me to write a book on my experiences called The Little Survivor. It was a cathartic, cathartic process of trying to deal with what had happened to me. And since that time, I've always been interested in uh, any kind of abuse. Also, when I was in Illinois, the um, senior judge asked me to head up a committee for substance abuse and uh, as well as uh, abuse in the home, which I did. And there were about 34 people on my committee, which included uh, the, uh, the ministers, the doctors, attorneys, and those kinds of people in my community. Were they already on the committee when the judge asked you to join it, or did you have to round them up? I had to round them up. And what did you do to round them up? I went to uh, different uh, persons who knew of other persons who would be interested, and I put the word out, so to speak, and they all came. And there was a little blurb in the newspaper, in the local newspaper, in reference to uh, the judge who was starting this program with me as the chair. Of all the people he could have picked, why did he pick you in particular? It was a female judge. She, pardon my, pardon my <laughs> sexism. And she picked me because she knew of my background uh, through a personal friend of hers. And that's how I came to um, chair that large committee. How would you say drug abuse and domestic violence are interconnected? Is there, is there some connection and if so, what is it? I feel that definitely there's a connection. Uh, if you talk about substance, you're talking about uh, the so-called hard drugs as well as alcohol. And certainly when there's alcohol, there in most cases that I'm familiar with, there, ha there has uh, uh, been abuse. So I see that they're connected in all the experiences that I've uh, had in the research that I've looked at. So that they were connected in your own childhood experience as well? No, no. I did not have any kind of uh, substance abuse. I'm, I mean your father, your in, father. No, my father was not an alcoholic, nor was my mother. Okay. Uh, my mother had a dislike for me, and therefore she uh, abused me both uh, verbally and emotionally. I'm working quite a bit with, in other organizations. Tell us about that. Well, uh, first, the mayor of Henderson, of course, is where I live, appointed me to the Blue Ribbon Commission. So I have a lot of work that I do for that. Our main focus is on helping the students become a part of service, or become a part of our community by doing services. So we have something called um, College Nights, and I started that myself three years ago, so that our students would be aware of 
all of the factors and, and, and the procedure for getting into college and finding scholarship money. And also we do a tree planting every spring, so we have one that's coming up. And uh, also we do Make a Difference Day. And that's pretty big. We pull students from all the high schools in the Henderson area. Uh, that's, uh, as I said before, uh, through, the, through the, the mayor here at Henderson. Also, I'm on the Achievement uh, Academy board. And we're the, first, we're the first school in the state of Nevada that uh, that addresses the needs of the high-function autistic children. Uh, what kind of needs do they have that sets them up?